just, um, I've noticed a lot of talk on social media and uh, Christians talking about, you know, all the, all the things that are going on, and, you know, especially the no singing in church rule. And we're outside today, so that's, you know, we're not breaking any rules, which is good, cool, but I just, uh, I was been thinking about that, and uh, I did a word search. I love word searches. And do you know that the, the English word worship uh, shows up, in the NIV at least, 254 times, but of those 254 times, only three of them are talking about music. And as my students like to know, uh, or hate, hate this about me, I love math. So when I had a number, I was like, ooh, I wonder how many hours a week that is. And so three times out of 254 is only 2.0116. Hours a week, and the rest of the time we should be doing worship that's different than just singing. And so you've heard probably the idea of living a lifestyle of worship. Paul talks about offering our bodies as a living sacrifice of worship to the Lord, and that's more than just singing on Sunday mornings. And so this is a great opportunity for us to really dive into what it means to live a life of worship. So that's my soapbox. Let's get back to the other stuff we're supposed to do. Here's a song. Another song I kind of like right now. It's called Lying in the Land.
heritage and so when they were like hey let's find a hymn I was like okay we'll do my favorite hymn my favorite Irish hymn be thou my vision um, but of course you can't talk about Irish Christianity without talking about St. Patrick and uh, so uh, I want to give you a couple things that you might not know about our dear friend Pat as I like to call him um, first of all he's not Irish Actually, was born in England, uh, what is modern-day Scotland, but at that, at that time was England. And uh, as as a uh, older child or a young adult, he was captured by Irish raiders and enslaved and taken to Ireland as a slave. And he lived there like that for uh, probably ten years or more. And he was eventually freed and went back to England. Um, and during that time, obviously, as a slave, he he really kind of internalized this idea of God and, and salvation and, and stuff like that. So when he went back to England, he studied theology uh, and, and wanted to know more about God. But he'd lived in Ireland for 10 plus years, and even as his captors, he developed this undying love for Ireland. And so after he was trained up, he went back to Ireland as the first missionary. And Ireland at, at that time was really a pagan nation. And so here he is, the first Christian to come into a new area. And, and we, especially in the CMA, we think about missions quite a bit. But, you know, to be brand new and to go into a country where there's no real religion, you know, the way we understand it had to have been a daunting thing. Um, he didn't drive the snakes out of Ireland. He didn't drink green beer. Uh, he did get a holiday named after him, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but he, his devotion was so strong that in 433, uh, there was a decree by the High King, and I'll come back to the High King later, High King Loder, very cool name. Uh, and, and as a pagan king, he decreed that no one could start a fire until he started the, he lit the fire that would begin um, the next pagan spring festival. But on Easter Eve, Patrick disobeyed that order and he lit a flame to signify the resurrection of Christ. And that moved this high king so much that even though he broke the laws, he allowed the Patrick to continue to share the gospel and to minister to the people of Ireland. And so there is a rich history of Christianity in Ireland, even today. Um, and that's where we come to Be Thou My Vision. Uh, I, I, there was this cool phrase I had never heard of before, and it's called an editorial wedding. And we'll, we'll dig into that in just a second. But um, one of the things I love about the hymns is it connects us to our spiritual ancestors, our spiritual forefathers. And we have hymns, and this is one where the lyrics come from, we think, the 8th century. And so Christians have been using these words for centuries and centuries to worship God and to learn more about God. And, but it wasn't until the 20th century that it really took off. And so in 1905, a lady, an Irish scholar by the name of Mary Byrne, uh, published a English translation of that old poem in um, the Journal of School of Irish Learning. And it sounded a little bit different than what we're used to. Here are some of the lines. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, none other is aught but the King of the Seven Heavens. Another line is, O heart of my heart, whatever befall me, the ruler of all, be thou my vision. And then, uh, to us on like, God, the high king of heaven. 
heaven, but in Ireland, the, 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 the highest king you could be is, a, is the chieftain. And so they're basically saying that the, the chieftain of my, of my clan is who I want to serve. Well, soon after that, um, someone started to publish previously unpublished uh, folk tunes from so in, uh, in 1909, a uh, uh, folk tune called The Slain Tune, and there's a Slain Hill. Actually, that's where, uh, that's where St. Patrick lit that famous fire so many years ago. Uh, that was published. And then in 1912, another lady, Eleanor Hull, took that poem and she versified it. I, I'd never heard that term before, versified. But that's when you take a poem and you make it a little bit more sing-song. And, uh, and then soon after that, in 1919, the Irish church hymnal married that poem, that versified poem, and that slain folk tune into the modern hymn that we now know as Be Thou My Vision. And so that's where it kind of got its start. And after World War II, American hymnalists, really, they, they heard it for the first time and it became popular, and now it's in almost every official hymnal that we have in America, and it has stood the test of time. So I'm going to sing this song, and I want you to listen to the lyrics and think about those things that we, we just learned. And, and really think about the centuries and centuries of Christians that have come and gone in this world and the legacy that they led that, that has led you here this morning. So be down my day. Thank you. 
thy king, even the king of all the kings, who is Lord of all the lords. And we praise you this morning, and we worship you, and we love you, and we love the rest of the service up to you. Begoshen Begora. It's hard for a Scotman to say that, by the way. Uh, um, this morning, we had asked the district superintendent, Bill Malik, to be here, and he really wanted to be here. But circumstances, situation set up, so he couldn't. So he sent us a little video. Let's watch that video now. Are we ready, guys? Good morning, Life Church. Bill Malik here, and I wish I could be with you today, but at the very least, I can be with you in this video. I want to say huge congratulations to Brandon Hall. Brandon and I have had a number of times we've been able to be together in training and it just one-on-one, -on -one, and I've absolutely enjoyed it every time. I think this man is a fast rising star in the Alliance and I appreciate his heart, his attitude, his uh, desire to learn. And so I'm looking forward to working with Brandon. I'm looking forward to his leadership and work with Life Church. And Life Church, I am so thankful for you. You've been so faithful to the district, even in these difficult times. You've been faithful to world mission. May God be praised and may the church be advanced by the great work that you are doing. So again, good morning, have a wonderful Sunday, and enjoy your celebration with Brandon. Well, it is a privilege and a pleasure to uh, bring the charge this morning. My good friend Bill, as he said, wanted to be here, but he couldn't. And so it, it's come to me. And it's kind of like Alistair Begg said uh, one time when he was asked to, s to step in for a famous speaker who couldn't make it. He said, well, you're expecting a howitzer. Instead, you get a pop gun. So, <laughs> but here's the thing. <laughs> you should be encouraged, Brandon, because I, I, the story of the young uh, uh, entrepreneur who went to the successful business person and wanted to learn as much as they could. They said, how have you become so successful? And they said, good decisions. And he said, how did you learn good decisions? Bad decisions. <laughs> now, over the years, I've made all the bad decisions you possibly can make in the ministry. Therefore, I think I am imminently equipped to offer some wisdom to you. All kidding aside, though, I want to start off by just saying you should be encouraged and humbled that God has chosen you to lead this congregation at this time in the history of the church in the United States. I believe that God has a special calling on your life, Brandon. And so I'm going to charge you before all these witnesses and before the living God who's here to hear these words that I have to say to you. Number one, Scripture tells us to preach the word. The emphasis there is the word. In season and out of season is what Paul says there. There was a famous pastor who, uh, when he was a young pastor, uh, he was preaching all the time, and the district superintendent was so upset with him because he wasn't doing other things. And he said, do you ever stop preaching? He says, oh, I only preach in season, in season and out of season. But the important thing is, is that you preach the word. Right now in the United States, the church is a mess. It's a mess because over the years, we've gotten away from actually preaching the word. We want to tickle people's ears, make them feel good. We don't want to offend them. And yet, we see the state that the church is in because of it. So I encourage you, preach the word, Brandon. Preach the word in season and out of season. The word is so important. Uh, Pastor Kip Heitzig, Skip Heitzig, just the other day I was listening to him, and he was saying one morning he got up there and he was preaching away, and he has a huge church, so whoever this was must have been close. But there was somebody that we're visiting for the first time, and he, he could hear the wife turn to her husband and go, this guy actually believes that the Bible is the Word of God. Can you believe that? Well, it is the Word of God. It's the power of God. So preach the Word all the time, in season, out of season. 
Brandon, you need to care for God's flock. Emphasis on its God's flock. It's not your flock, you're an under shepherd. It's his flock, ultimately. In fact, I brought you something to remind you that and bequeathing this to you. It's, it's a cap I've had for a long time. It says, not the shepherd, just the sheepdog. <laughs> it's all beat up. But give yourself a couple of years and you'll be like this hat. <laughs> okay? So this is yours. Don't forget it. The thing we need to remember, Brandon, is that there's only one Messiah and we're not him. And so what we as pastors need to do is to do what you do so well, and that is to raise up others. Raise up others to minister to the flock. The 80-20 principle, or the 20-80 principle, however you want to look at it. You're going to spend 80% of your time with 20% of your people so that those 20% can minister to the other 80% the way they need to be ministered to. Hang on to that. You are, not the, you are not the Messiah, and neither am I. There's only one Messiah, so what should we do? We should lead people to that Messiah. I can't tell you how many times someone's come into my office and asked to counsel with me, and I don't have an answer, but I lead them to Jesus. I pray for them. I lead them to Jesus. I point them to Jesus. And in order to do that, we need to lead by example. You know, sometimes people say, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are speaking too loud. Your life will speak louder than any of your sermons ever will. And I am impressed with your life already. Also, Brandon, to care for the flock, you need to love the flock enough to do what Paul calls us to do in 2 Timothy. You need to reprove them, you need to rebuke them, and you need to exhort them. Now, the word reprove sounds pretty harsh, but really what it means is to, to convict somebody. To convict someone by your actions and by your words. First by your actions, second by your words. And you need to love them enough to do that. You need to love your flock enough, Brandon, to rebuke them at times. To say, no, don't go that direction. You'll hurt yourself, you'll hurt your witness, you'll hurt your family. You'll hurt your walk with Christ. It's not popular. It's not what you want to do if you want to build a gigantic church in a hurry. But you have to stand before the Lord someday and answer for what we did and didn't do. So I need you to love your flock enough to reprove them, to rebuke them, and to exhort them, which means to encourage them. When things are tough, like they are right now, to say, God's going to see us through. Let's just keep moving forward. You know, one of the greatest examples I've ever seen in my life of someone who does this is my wife, Sid, with, my, with our kids. She never just said, because I said so. Oh, maybe she did say once or twice. <laughs> but I was always impressed that she would take the time not just to say no, but to explain why. And also ask them to think so that they could stand on their own two feet. And that's what we need to do with the congregation so that they can stand on their own two feet. I remember uh, years ago when I was at Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith talked about the fact that one day there was a knock at his door and his secretary said, there's someone here to see you. And he said, send them in. And, and 13 people came in with briefcase and ties on. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and he says, can I help you? And they said, we've been knocking on a lot of doors. You have thousands of people that come to your church. And they all say, you can answer for us. And he told them to get out of his office. And he told his people, don't ever do that again. Stand on your own two feet. Grow in the word of God. Don't do that. So love people enough to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, so that they can stand on their own two feet. Brandon, very important. Remember your calling. Remember when God called you. I know that Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, remember when the elders laid hands on you to be a pastor. And that was very important, but there was something that was even further back for Timothy that was important, and, and we're all going to experience that. You're going to experience that too, Brandon, I guarantee you, because there's going to come those times in your life 
when you're going to go, really, God, did I miss it? Did I not hear your voice? Because things are not going to go right. Things are going to go wrong. Even when you're seeking after God, in fact, especially when you're seeking after God, Satan's going to come after you. And you need to remember when God called you. When, when God called us to pastor the church in Hawaii, we had a horrific experience there. Just about split the church. Um, it was one of the hardest things in our life that, that we as a husband and wife have ever experienced. And I, I was questioning myself as to whether or not God had actually called me. And I had to remember back. And then one day I was reading in John about the Good Shepherd. And it said, the hireling will leave the sheep when a predator comes, but the shepherd won't. And God reminded me that in the midst of all those horrific things and not great choices that I had made, I stayed there because he had a call in my life. And sometimes that's all you've got to hang on to. You hang on to that. I know God's called you. I know God's going to use you. God already is using you. And here's the thing. You will make mistakes. The rest of you hear that? He's going to make mistakes. Okay? And that's all right. Because God's going to do some amazing things through him. And none of us is perfect, right? Well, except for my wife. But the rest of us, maybe not so much. Brandon, I want you to practice your priorities. Have a quiet time. Now, I know you. You're like me. You're a doer. If you're busy, you're happy. I suspect that I won't know how many things I could have done for God if I had more quiet times in my ministry until I get to heaven. It's like, the, I heard there was a contest once. There was these two guys up in Canada, and they were amazing lumberjacks. I mean, Paul Bunyan type. So they decided to have a contest on who could cut the most wood with axes. And so they put them in these rooms with a wall between them, and they had all this wood, and they, they hit the timer. They could hear each other chopping away. But on one side, every once in a while, for about two or three minutes, there would be silence. And the guy on the other side just kept chopping. He's going, I've got this. Be safe. Be safe. At the end of the contest, the guy in the other room where it had been quiet had more things cut. And his, his friend next door said, how did you do that? He says, every once in a while, I stop and shop, sharpen my axe. <laughs> I know daytimers are out of, out of style. We do that on our phone now. But on your phone... Just set time to be with God. And then if somebody says it's going to meet you at that time, say, no, I've got a meeting. That's all they need to know. Brandon, take care of your family. God, family, church. God, family, church. I'll say that for you because I know you don't want to say that in the I'll say it for you. When I was a young pastor, my wife will tell you, I ran helter-skelter everywhere. All anybody needed to do was call me on the phone and say, I have an emergency. As I got older, I learned some things. And a lot of conversations with those people went like this. What's the problem? My marriage is falling apart. I think my husband's going to leave me. I say, how long has this been going on? Six years. I'll see you Tuesday at 9. <laughs> I don't need to come there right now. I need to be with my family. I need to be with my family. I need to be with my wife. I need to be with my children. Maybe a crisis in your mind, and I'm sure it is, but if it's been going on for six years, I'll see you Tuesday. And then, the church. Because the greatest witness you'll ever have to these people is your marriage. That's been my greatest witness. At least that's what people tell me. Brandon, I believe that you will be a much greater Jedi than I ever was. And I mean that. And I'm happy about that. I'm excited about that. 
but please just take these simple things and put them into practice and you will see how much God can use it in your life. Now I want to speak to all of you for a minute. We're going to have a new senior pastor in just a couple of minutes. Here's what you need to do for him. Number one, pray for him. Above all else, start now. You think that you're the only ones that know he's going to be the new senior pastor? You think Satan doesn't know that? You think Satan isn't already working on him? I can tell you that he is. He will now be the target, the main target, the big target. Pray for him. Pray for him. You say, well, I wish he would preach better. Pray. I wish he would counsel more wisdom. Pray. I wish you would lead with more clarity. Pray. Don't pray too hard because you might get so good some bigger church will come and take him, but pray. <laughs> Seriously. He needs your covering. He, he's the number one target right now. He needs your covering. Provide for his physical needs. <laughs> I love the pastor that was meeting with the board, and he was looking for a raise. And the board came to him and said, we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is, the bad news is you don't get a raise. The good news is now you qualify for our food bank. <laughs> if you take care of him, so he doesn't have to worry about the finances, he can take care of you. If he's worried about the finances and he has to take side jobs or whatever it is, that's stealing from you and stealing from God. Don't do that. Don't figure out how little you can pay him. See how you can honor him and bless him. My wife and I, the very first church we were at, they were trying to see how little they could pay us. And they were doing a good job of it. And then we had an older man, Lenny, who came who had been a pastor and he'd been an elder. And he got on the board and he talked to the board. And life changed for us. I could focus on the church more. I didn't have to worry about whether our vehicle was going to work. We could make it to church. All of those things. Take care of him. Take care of his physical needs. Bless him as your pastor. And God will bless you. Protect him. I can't emphasize this enough. Protect him. When somebody comes to you and says, I want to complain about the pastor... Say, stop right there. If you have something to say, with respect, go to your pastor and share it with him. I don't want to hear about it. In about a month and a couple of weeks, I'm not going to be here anymore. We'll be in the area. If you want to call and talk to me, I would love it. If you want to call and talk to me about complaining to me about your new pastor, I'm going to hang up on you. I need it. Protect him. Protect him. Don't gossip. Here's a good one. Praise him. Some of the things that you hear as a pastor are interesting. I heard about one pastor who was at the back door shaking hands, and this lady came up and said, You know, Pastor, every sermon you preach is better than your next one. <laughs> I had to think about that, didn't you? <laughs> Don't wait for Pastor Appreciation Day. Praise him. Don't. You say, well, he'll get a swell head. God can take care of that. Not a problem. But he also might be encouraged to keep moving forward. And he might be encouraged to be an even greater blessing to all of you. Participate with him. <laughs> we don't have it in this church. It's getting to be something that's of the past. But in the past, almost every church I ever preached at, traveled to, there was an amen Charlie. And if they liked what you said, amen. Usually in the back, amen. Well, there were two amen Charlies in this one church. 
And when the pastor got up and said, you know, as a church, we need to learn to walk. Amen in the back, right? pastor says, you know, as a church, we need to learn to jog. Amen. In fact, we need to learn to run. Amen. And in order to do that, we all need to participate and give. Let the church walk. Let the church walk. We want the church to go forward. Be the church. Use your gifts. Find out where God can use you. Participate. The blessed socks off. You'll need a bigger tent real soon. You do that. I guarantee you. And finally, be patient with him. Have you noticed God doesn't call perfect people to the church? Anybody notice that? Yeah. And he doesn't call perfect pastors either. There is no such thing. So be patient with him. This is a man who loves God and loves his people. And God's going to use him. And you're going to allow him to grow. And as he grows, you're going to be blessed. What I'd like to do right now is I'd like to ask Brandon and Jenna and the elders and Matt and my wife come up to the stage if you would please. I know it's I know it's not a lot of room up there, but come on up guys so everybody can see. You can stay down there, it's okay. <laughs> In fact, since you're down there, we'll all come down, not a problem. Jenna is just as much a part of this. Um, there's no way that I'd be able to do ministry all these years without my lovely wife, Sid, and her support. And so we called her up there because this is a team. Um, this is a team. So what I want to do now is, um, Rick, I'm going to turn this on. I'm just warning you, okay? There we go. I'd like to have all the elders come and lay hands on these sweet people. Would you do that right now, please? Okay. And Sid, you do that. And uh, I've got a microphone here, and so you can either talk real loud or you can have the mic. But let's, let's pray for these people. Should we do that? Listen to and obey the words we keep gave that we, we put God first, we put family first. And that means in front of our jobs and in front of everything else. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray protection over his family, over his children, and over his church. I pray that you walk with him, give him strength and wisdom and courage. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray.
Oh, Lord Jesus, when you spoke to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3 and you appeared to him at Gibeon in a dream, uh, he asked you for wisdom and guidance to be able to judge correctly. And you were so pleased with that, you gave him not only that wisdom above every other man that's walked on earth except for Jesus. And you also gave him long life, you also gave him riches and all the other things that he didn't ask for. So thank you, Jesus, for reminding us from your word that you love it when we ask for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so, Jesus, that's what I pray for my brother and for my sister, that you would show them how to lead your people, that they would hold on to your hand day by day, and, Lord, that you would come for them, that you continually come for them. Remind my brother that you have called him to be a king, Thank you that he's been a faithful warrior, and now it's time to become the king that you called him to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is out of Colossians chapter 1, where Jesus, we continually will ask you to fill Brandon and Jenna with the knowledge of your will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that they may live a life worthy of you, Jesus, and praise you in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that they may have great endurance and patience, that they would be able to give joyful thanks to you, Father, who has qualified them and us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. We thank you, Jesus, you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that you love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We pray this blessing on the whole family, Lord Jesus. Protect their marriage. Protect their family. As Pastor Keith said, they are now in the front lines of battle. And at this moment, Lord Jesus, we pray a special covering over their marriage. Mm -hmm. Ask that you would draw them individually, first and foremost, to you, to you, for deep union. Because I know when that happens, Lord, they will supernaturally grow closer to each other. Mm -hmm. And give them as parents all the wisdom and knowledge we just prayed for to understand how to bring that into their home in the lives of their children, so that they, too, will be full of that living water that will splash out on all of us. And we thank you, Jesus, for bringing this family here for a time such as this. In your precious name, Jesus. Father, you've, you've heard these prayers from these men who you've called as elders and leaders here at this church. And I don't think I need to say anything more except amen. 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 Why don't you hug those people? And even in spite of COVID. <laughs> Amen. Jenna, hang on before you leave them. You want to? Yeah. Um, and. This is just in case anybody wasn't here to prove this actually happened. It says this this certificate commemorates the installation service for Pastor Brandon Hall, Life Community Church, Pastor Robles, presented by me. And uh, can you get on your wall with pride, my brother? Oh no no no! The good luck. I'll hold that for you. And uh, as our new senior pastor, I think you should uh, close this out. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a lot of days and weeks and conversations over coffee, some official board meetings and some unofficial in the, in the water uh, surfing. And... Uh, Man, I'm so thrilled. I'm excited. Glad you guys could make it out. 
Um, going forward, if you know me, I'm thinking five years, ten years down the road, excited to see what God's um, going to really grow from this. He's doing a huge work. He's bringing a lot of people to himself through the work of the cross, through his son, and we get to be a part of it as his sons and daughters. And uh, one thing we shared with you earlier, Posh, a good friend of ours, and actually the OG, uh, second with Keith, with our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, he grew up in it. So he's excited to be a part of the team coming on in September. And then uh, Christian Cooper grew up in the area, has been wanting to come back and God moved in a way that only he could in this time where a lot of churches are looking for a youth minister. And he said, I have one for you. You know him well. He knows the area well. He will be joining us at the beginning of August. So the first week in August he'll be here. And has a heart for youth and kids, which has been our prayer as a leadership to find someone who loves families, loves youth and kids well, and has a heart to grow. So we already have a great team, and God keeps blessing us and making our church full and fuller. So thank you again. Just want to share that update with you guys. So as you see new faces around, uh, they're probably going to stay. And hopefully new families will continue to come and, and get connected and grow. And, and our hope and, and goal is, is these prayers are for you. As individuals and families, we draw near to the Lord, and we might encourage, fan that flame, strengthen you, and we're excited to see what God's going to do through this church. So let's sing one last song as we close out, and then uh, we got some water for those that are warm. We need to cool off, and we'll hang out for the rest of the time together. So the song about his faith.
Life Church plans to continue to gather at our church building in whatever way we're able, adjusting the current guidelines and keeping everyone's safety in mind. So if you're in the area, we do invite you to come into the community of Life Church. And right now, that means meeting outside of our building. But hey, this is Central California, and we can do that. Okay? So as we adjust to meeting outside, if you're able and you could come by early on Sundays and help us set up, that'd be great. If so, contact Stacy Jeffers at stacy at lccpaso.org. That'd be a great help. And of course, we will continue to have this live stream. So remember our meeting times, life groups, small groups, different ways you can give your gifts. Children's curriculum, it's all posted on our website at lccpaso.org. If you're new to Life Church, we would love to connect with you. Would you text WELCOME to 805-330-3744, 805-330-3744. On a special note, I want to thank those of you that have made the effort to set up your gift giving online. Thank you for your consistent, faithful giving. And if you're new to online giving, you can make your gifts to Life Church at lccpaso.org. Make a difference. There's a button on the homepage, and when you click that, it'll take you to a safe and secure site for your gift. And we encourage those of you that are comfortable using an app to give your gift, use the Church Center app. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your continuous sacrificial giving. You really are keeping the positive message and life-changing message of Jesus going into the lives of hundreds of people through this live stream. You're also equipping our pastors and staff to continue to reach out to help others. God is using your gifts to change lives. Thank you. Final thoughts? We're here for you, and we'd love to support you in prayer. We invite you to let us know how we can pray for you or how we can pray with you for others. Text your prayer requests, 805-330-3744. 805-330-3744. Well, I want to end with a blessing from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 6, as we head into a new future. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thanks again for being here.